Uh, so good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome you to this ancillary meeting of mapping and mitigating the impacts of illicit trade on the sustainable development goals. Um, we thank you for logging in to view this. Um, if the viewers have any questions during the session, I'd ask you to please put them in the chat box and we will address them either at the end of each panelist or at the end of the session. Um, so welcome again, let me introduce myself. I'm the moderator for this session. My name is Graham Mott. I am an economic, uh, economics affairs officer at UNCTAD, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. So at UNCTAD, we believe we have a critical responsibility to help our member states uh, defend themselves against illicit trade. The Addis Ababa Action Agenda recognizes illicit trade as an engine for inclusive economic growth and poverty reduction, and an important means to achieve the sustainable development goals. However, this potential is significantly compromised by illicit forms of trade, which happens across all sectors of the economy, They're particularly prevalent in pharmaceuticals, fishing, forestry, petroleum and petroleum products, mining, and all forms of products vulnerable to trademark, counterfeiting, and copyright piracy. This illicit activity crowds out more than two trillion US dollars in legitimate economic growth. The alarming consequences are especially evident in developing countries, hard pressed to monetize resources, commercialize innovation, attract investment, and establish lasting job opportunities. Indeed, this scar on the face of trade creates a triple threat to financing of development. It crowds out legitimate economic activity, deprives governments of revenue for investment in vital public services, and increases the cost of achieving the SDGs by eroding the progress already made. We know that illicit trade negatively affects all 17 SDGs, but our panelists today will pay, pay particular attention to SDG 16, promoting peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, providing access to justice for all, and building effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. And why is this? Well, illicit trade is a serious threat to the rule of law. Links between illicit trade and organized crime are well established, from human trafficking networks and tobacco smuggling to fuel theft by drug cartels, and the involvement of the mafia and organized criminal groups in the trade of counterfeit goods. These malignancies weaken law enforcement and destabilize communities and economies. Perhaps most frightening are the links to terrorist financing that highlight heightened threats to national and global security. Indeed, illicit trade is not a problem confined to developing countries. Every country suffers from this menace. All that varies is the magnitude of the problem. So that, that being said, let me introduce you to our uh, august panel, um, our three panelists for today, who will address the issues of illicit trade, criminal activity, and the achievement of the SDGs. Firstly, I'd like to introduce Jeff Hardy. He is the Director General of the Transnational Alliance to Combat Illicit Trade. TRASA is an organization best known for its unique multi-sector approach to tackling illicit trade. It deals with everything from pharmaceuticals to forestry and everything in between. Jeff will be outlining today some of the findings, findings from Trasset's report on illicit trade in the UN SDGs, including some specific findings on the criminal elements underpinning illicit trade in their relationship to SDG 16. He'll also be sharing observations from during the COVID-19 pandemic, showing that criminal groups have swiftly exploited the situation and entrenched their positions in illicit trade. Next up, we have Shane Britton, of CEO of Crime Stoppers International. Crime Stoppers International is an international network that works with law enforcement worldwide by enabling individuals to share information about crime anonymously, leading to safer, more sustainable societies. The principal areas of Crime Stoppers focus are on transnational crime and criminal activity linked to illicit trade, human trafficking, environmental and wildlife crime, among other things. Shane himself has a background in counter-terrorism and intelligence capability development, 
including work around the world to build homeland security, security agencies and bring unique technology in to assist with staying ahead in the fight against crime. Today, Shane will be sharing some examples of where his organization has ob observed criminal activity associated with illicit trade. And finally, but certainly not least, we have Filippo Mosca. He is the Director, Director General of the Syracuse International Institute for Cri Criminal Justice and Human Rights. Syracuse Institute is an Italian not-for-profit foundation dedicated to education, training and research in the fields of international and comparative criminal justice and human rights. Its purpose is to contribute to international peace and security through the effective implementation of criminal law, as well as promote the rule of law and protect human rights in criminal justice systems worldwide. The Institute is currently in the process of concluding its work on a mechanism for combating illicit trade, which they believe will be helpful in shaping international benchmarks in the fight against illicit trade. Filippo, in this session, will be sharing some of the recommendations from this recent body of work, with a focus on those that might be valuable in mitigating the criminal elements of illicit trade. So um, let's begin with uh, Jeff Hardy of Trasset. So Jeff, um, perhaps you could just uh, tell us a little bit about the report which you published on the impacts of illicit trade uh, and how it affects, affects all of the SDGs. Uh, and partic particularly the special focus on the parts that deal with criminal activity that undermine the goals. Yeah, sure, Graham. Thanks uh, for that introduction. Um, you know, I was just thinking about this with the, when they were talking about all the COVID-19 provisions. You know, it was right around a year ago, this time last year, that we were at your place at UNCTAD in Geneva, and I had the opportunity to present uh, this report that we put together where we mapped the negative impacts of illicit trade against um, all 17 of the sustainable development goals. And, you know, that was really a what I thought was pretty revealing of how devastating illicit trade is across, you know, all aspects of the economy and society. And so, you know, when we were getting ready to prepare for this com Congress, we dug a little bit deeper uh, into that report and looked a little bit more closely at the criminal elements that underpin basically all forms, all 12 of the forms of illicit trade that we work at, at Trace It at least. And I think, you know, the overall message that I want to share today during this pet, this, this session is that, you know, addressing illicit trade and co combating all the forms of associated criminal activity and corruption are, I think by the time I get done talking, you know, evidence of this, the central significance of achieving SG. SDG 16. Um, and I thought really that those findings would be of paramount importance to the, this Congress. You know, it's entitled Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice. And at Trace It, at least, we don't think that you can, governments can achieve those goals uh, without taking a close look at and acting strongly against illicit trade. So, um, you know, listen, I've put together some slides that I want to walk through to tell that story. So I'm going to click over here and see if I can start sharing that uh, PowerPoint, Graham, if you don't mind. Uh, let's go to that. I don't know if everyone can see these or me still. That's fine, Jeff. We can see. And do you still see me? <laughs> or is that just the Unfortunately slide? not, just the slide. Okay. Well, listen, let me roll through some of these real quick. Then I'll come back and we can talk a little about this. But I thought it'd be interesting really just to quickly mention what we are. We are a uh, not-for-profit private sector organization. Uh, we're a business trade association. And we basically we put this we put trace it together to help business be smarter and to help governments take a more effective holistic approach and as you mentioned in your introduction we look at illicit trade in 12 different sectors that i show there with those icons 
Uh, I thought it'd be worthwhile to quickly share who the TRACET members are. As you can see, all of them uh, are operating in sectors that are vulnerable to you know, unfair, illicit versions of, of their legal trade. Um, you know, the way we go about uh, uh, fighting these, this issue is we look at the common vulnerabilities, and oftentimes that's looking where the supply chain has been exploited, uh, whether that's transport, whether that's online platforms, whether that's border controls. Uh, what we've found is that, you know, that, that uh, criminal operators in different sectors, you know, use these same channels. Uh, and we also try to expose the associated crimes with uh, illicit trade, whether that's money laundering, human trafficking, forced labor, and corruption. Uh, you know, we we try to channel our work to driving the international agenda, as we did in the meeting that we held in Onktan. The idea is to try to explain the problem, uh, to educate governments, uh, to introduce, you know, uh, gold standards where we can on what we think is is best in solving the problem, and then uh, hoping that the, that member states and governments around the country around the world can take up some of the recommendations that we're putting forward and do a better job of fighting illicit trade. And we also try to drive our advocacy by you know um, creating education and informational materials. You know what? How has this problem happened? And what are the solutions? And you can see some of the recent publications that we've put together, including uh, a very popular study we did, uh, we launched in January this year on uh, fraudulent advertising online. It's very interesting. You see people who innocently are skimming through their Facebook accounts are being exposed to fraudulent ads that take people to counterfeiting websites. So that's a little bit of the background on, you know, who I am, my organization, and what we're trying to achieve. And that, you know, these publications take us to this report that we put together last year, um, where we mapped uh, the negative impact of illicit trade across all 17 of the SDGs. So you see on the left column in the blue, those are the 12 sectors. And for each of those 12 sectors, we analyzed and explored, you know, where uh, they had a negative downward effect on the SDGs. So the way we got started with this work really started about three years ago as we were uh, visiting different countries, um, talking to government officials, uh, trade ministers, finance ministers, uh, customs officials, tax, uh, tax and finance officials about illicit trade across the different sectors. And we kept hearing about the economic losses they were experiencing, the job losses, the lost tax revenues, you know, environmental damage, corruption. And the more I listened to these different governments, uh, this photo here happens to be from Argentina, the more it sounded that it was the exact opposite of what we were trying to achieve with the SDGs. You know, the SDGs are trying to promote economic growth. They're trying to promote you know, uh, environmental protection. And in the case of this conference, you know, they're trying to promote peace and justice. And so that gave uh, birth to this report where we were asking ourselves, how in fact does illicit trade impact the SDGs? Does it impact all of them? Are the impacts interconnected? Are developing countries you know, more severely impacted. And that's why we set off to do this study and found that in fact, all of them were impacted in one way or another. Uh, they're interconnected in a way, and this is an interesting slide on good health. Let, let's take two sectors you wouldn't think of, medicines that have no active in, ingredient and toxic illicit alcohol, both set back progress on good health and well-being, achieving SDG3. So, um, these are the types of findings that we that we came out in the study and that we've been publishing. But what I wanted to draw our attention to here is this slide, in that for all 12 of the illicit trade sectors that we work in, all 12 of them negatively impacted two of the SDGs. One of them is SDG 8 uh, for decent work and economic growth. And the other one is SDG 16, 
uh, for peace and justice. And it's because of that that we looked a little bit deeper into this situation. Um, we put together a, a spinoff report of the, of the, of the publication we, we did with you a year ago, and we looked at the negative impacts on SDG 16, sector by sector by sector. We focused on the criminal elements, and then, as you mentioned in the intro, we threw in some observations over this last year of where we saw illicit trade pick up during the pandemic. So the next couple of slides uh, before I go off the, the PowerPoint, I just wanted to share four or five examples of um, where criminal activity is present uh, and forceful uh, in terms of illicit trade and how, in fact, the, the, that those would negatively impact uh, our goals for peace and uh, um, in, in each of the countries. So with the agri-food industry, I pulled up an example here because we have some Italian speakers on our panel, but the agro-mafia uh, is a significant player in uh, the Italian economy, uh, counterfeiting olive oil, cheese, as you can see. Uh, it's a multi-million dollar organization that funds other aspects of, of uh, criminal activity in Italy. Uh, sugar smuggling, for example, uh, across the border in Kenya is a big source of revenue for organized crime in Africa. Um, moving on to the pesticides industry, um, profits from illegal pesticides have become a major source of, act of um, financing for organized criminal activities. Uh, some studies done by one of your counterparts, Unicri, uh, shows that there's 70 euros of profit for every kilogram trafficked. Uh, leads to hundreds of millions in revenue every year. Uh, we took an example from counterfeiting. Uh, one of the things about counterfeiting that the uh, organizations like Europol are finding is that, you know, the illicit sales from counterfeit fund other criminal activities, uh, including narcotics trafficking and human trafficking. And, and there's a study out of, uh, of uh, Unifab in France that actually shows uh, where terrorist networks use counterfeit sales to finance their operations. So it's pretty significant impact the, that the illicit activity ha is tied to, in the case, here's a case in fishing industry, illicit fishing uh, is tied to the drug and firearms trafficking, money laundering, tax fraud, bribery, all sorts of criminal activity, for example, in Southeast Asia, where the fishing boats that are used to harvest illicit, Ill, illicit fish farms uh, are also used for all kinds of other activities in smuggling and human trafficking. So it's a very uh, interconnected negative uh, criminal uh, uh, industry out there associated with illicit trade. Same thing to go with, with the petroleum. A lot of you probably heard these extreme uh, situations where pipeline siphoning or hijacking oil supplies from uh, offshore tankers are used to finance organized crime and non-state actors uh, in the Middle East and in Africa. So um, trying to show just how deeply embedded criminal activity is in illicit trade uh, to make the case that governments we are encouraging governments, you know, to stop the commercial aspects of illicit trade as a way to um, clean up the criminal activity that is driven by the by the commercial profits. Um, I think my conclusion here is that uh, I was trying to show that how the criminal activity and the corruption underline so under underpins so much criminal activity out there. Uh, and it undermines the goals. It, by feeding violence, it undermines the target of 16.1. It exploits the use of women and children as forced labor, uh, undermining 16.2. Uh, undermines the rule of law in terms of corruption, 16.5. Money laundering, 16.4. Financing terrorism, 16A. So you can see um, 
that the criminal activity and illicit trade are very much standing in the way of our ability to achieve SDG 16. So I'm going to stop sharing. So th 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 yeah. thank you for that. Thank you for that, Jeff. Um, I think it's a really nice presentation of what is, I think, a very important report that shows not just the magnitude of illicit trade, which I think you've mentioned before is, if you quantify it, something like the eighth biggest economy in the world, if it were an economy, but also just how kind of widespread and pernicious into all aspects of the economy and all sectors illicit trade can be. Um, now, we know that illicit trade is tends to be ad adaptable and flexible by its very nature. And we all know that in the last year that those have been quite significant uh, qualities for, for most of the population um, worldwide. So I wonder if you could just tell us a bit more about how uh, illicit trade has adapted and entrenched itself perhaps in the, uh, in the last year during the COVID pandemic. Yeah, you know, um, the, the pandemic, when this first started, we were, you know, we were on the lookout uh, for what we could observe. And I, I think I don't want to over, overcook the situation. You know, I, I've been talking you know, for the last few minutes about 12 different illicit trade sectors, frankly, not all of them um, were accelerated by the pandemic. But certainly there are two cases that I wanted to, to highlight here. And if we've got more time, I can talk about some of the others. But that's um, illicit trade in, I guess for the best way to say it, in the pharmaceuticals sector or counterfeiting and taken together. And the first thing that we noticed right around March, April of last year was the uptick in the availability of counterfeit face masks, gloves, gels, sanitizers, what they what, what we now all kind of know a new a new acronym called PPE, personal protection equipment. And there was an absolute flood. Uh, primarily in online marketplaces of fake versions of these. I have some statistics here. 2,490% increase in the availability of fake face masks immediately um, following the onset of the pandemic and a 270% increase in hand sanitizers, you know, those hand sanitizers that we've all been using. So, I mean, there was just a a, a crazy um, growth in basically, basically criminals who are willing to take advantage of the fear of people that were just, had never dealt with anything like this pandemic before. I mean, uh, organizations like Europol and Interpol raced uh, into this space and shut down these websites left and right, shut down um, borders and seized all kinds of uh, containers with these these products in them. Um, so that was one of the areas that was um, considerably impacted. As you can imagine, now that various the, the vaccines are being rolled out, that's the new area for the counterfeiters. Uh, is to start peddling fake remedies um, like vaccines. So I think one message that I want to leave this audience that I picked up on a webinar like this hosted by Europol was to point out that there are no uh, safe vaccines that are sell sold online. You do not go online to find a vaccine. Um, the other sector, Graham, that I'll just talk about for a minute is the... Uh, the increase in illicit alcohol trade. So uh, what we saw is in, when the pandemic set in is that a number of governments around the country started to introduce supply restrictions. Now, in the end, these turned out to be bad policy decisions, but we certainly understood where governments were coming from because they were all grappling with uh, how, do we, how do we implement social distancing? So I think it was around 20 countries introduced supply restrictions. The worst were in South Africa, India, and Mexico, where they introduced absolute bans of production and consumption of alcohol, all with the intent, the good intent, 
to improve social distancing. But what happened there is as soon as you, as you may know from Economics 101, as soon as you restrict the supply of a product, people turn to alternatives. And in these, these countries that I mentioned my name earlier, they already had significant markets, uh, 20 to 25% of illicit product. So as soon as the legal supplies were taken off the marketplace, uh, the demand for and the supply of illicit started to flood. And you had a lot of negative activity or not negative impacts. The, probably the most alarming was the deaths associated with a lot of this stuff is toxic. So people were consuming these toxic alternatives and sadly dying. I think the the death count that we had had when we, by the time we published our report was about a thousand worldwide. But most relevant was the increase in criminal activity and the entrenching of the marketplaces that already had a decent share. And I had a quote here from the South African Revenue Service, which went public and pointed out that this was, this the ban was uh, unfortunately benefiting criminal networks who were, you know, gaining footholds in the marketplace. So, you know, the pandemic year in some cases really bumped up the illicit activity, uh, especially when, you know, customs officials, border control, law enforcement were preoccupied with quarantines and lockdowns and things like that. So uh, those are our primary observations, Graham. Uh, thanks for making those points, Jeff. I think you touched upon a couple of things there that UNGTAD we've been very uh, conscious of and been doing some work on. So the export restrictions that many countries put in place, as you say, is uh, given kind of space and room for uh, criminal activity, especially in pharmaceuticals and uh, the mm -hmm. market. Um, and, and also something you mentioned about the kind of growth in the online digital economy of illicit trade. You know, obviously, digital services and the digital economy has expanded considerably in the last year and illicit trade has been very quick to take uh, advantage of that. So thanks for your comments, Jeff, and thanks for your presentation. I'd now like to move on to uh, Shane Britton, uh, who, as I said before, is the CEO of Crime Stoppers International. So Shane, I wonder if you could tell us um, a bit more about Crime Stoppers and the organization's work on illicit trade in general. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Graham. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. I really appreciate it. Uh, and it's it's great to follow Jeff's comments. I certainly agree with everything he said. Something that you were just finishing up on that I'd like to touch on before I introduce Crime Stoppers is, is that online marketplace. And that's, that's certainly something that we're seeing uh, a substantial growth in, and that's the availability of counterfeit and illicit goods being sold through internet channels. Um, during the pandemic, that's something that we all through everyday life started interacting with the internet in, in a more commerce centric way. Uh, everyone's been purchasing packages and all sorts of things online. And, and so those distribution channels have really become a major factor of our daily lives. Even people who traditionally wouldn't purchase daily materials from the internet. Um, and so we've certainly seen a substantial growth in that. Um, and that's, that's something I think we all should be concerned about. But, uh, but Crime Stoppers International, so we, uh, we're the coordinating and governing body of the 800 Crime Stopper programs around the world. Uh, we're currently in 29 countries uh, with national programs. Uh, and essentially, if there's a country or a region where there's not a national or a regional Crime Stoppers presence, then Crime Stoppers International takes care of, of those areas. And really what we aim to do is to provide a link between law enforcement and government agencies and the everyday people, members of the public. Uh, one of the, the things we're most passionate about is making sure that members of the public are able to report criminal activity um, or suspected illegal activity through to government agencies and be able to do that in a genuinely anonymous way. And that really opens a channel for them to avoid any uh, any comeback on them, any consequences, any uh, penalties against themselves or their family, and also helps to avoid um, some level of corruption in the, that process in certain parts of the world. So that's that's really our mission. Uh, you can access Crime Stopper reports on our website and lodge reports on on illegal activity or suspected illegal activity. Um, and we provide that connection through to law enforcement for the uh, for the action. Uh, 
of those. Something that, that we receive a, a substantial amount of information on is illicit trade. Um, you know, that's it's actually a fairly new topic for me. Uh, as, as you said in your introduction, counterterrorism is my background. Um, but I came across illicit trade in that counterterrorism sphere. And, and as Jeff mentioned, there have been reports around the world of, uh, of terrorist groups either obtaining funding um, or financing operational activity through illicit trade. And, and their comments I would very strongly endorse that that's something I've seen. It's something that is enormously concerning. Um, and terrorist groups historically have seen money making uh, as a thing to do however they can, whatever the easiest and most effective way they can do that. And that's been everything from uh, petty criminal activity to ram raiding of, of automatic teller machines, uh, even bank robberies and things of that nature. But illicit trade, because it is becoming so prevalent around the world, is, is increasingly becoming a target of this. And whether that's the smuggling of narcotics or of uh, counterfeit goods or tobacco or alcohol, Really, I think what we should all be concerned about is that the the item is a function of profit and risk. And if the profit outweighs the risk, then the groups we're talking about will look at whatever that item might actually be. So the biggest concern we have as a as a not for profit in the law enforcement assistance space is is that if if some of these syndicates, if organized crime syndicates have a strong connection, if they have a distribution network, an ability to import large amounts of items, then the items that are involved can fluctuate uh, and really can fluctuate based on demand and based on profitability. That's a huge concern if, if those products then turn to people, to wildlife items, to weapons, to other support mechanisms for terrorist organizations or even for terrorist individuals themselves. So that's that's our concern. That's certainly why Crime Stoppers has become involved in this space. Um, and and really, we we want to increase our focus over the next twelve months to what we can do to support members of the public identifying this activity, reporting it back to law enforcement agencies, uh, and really trying to make a difference in in how those things are prosecuted and taken through to to prosecution. Thank, thanks, Shane. I, th I think uh, your organisation and also you, so your kind of career shows a really nice. Uh, Somehow, how illicit trading criminal activity are intrinsically linked. Uh, and I think one of the things you touched on there is about how, how widespread illicit, illicit trade can be within criminal activity. I think one of the things that, that we've touched upon before in, in, in our other forum at UNCTAD is that it's really easy with the, with the networks that, criminal, that criminals have and criminal organizations have, it's how adaptable they are just to, to different products to bring those into their existing networks. Now, um, as more so than UNCTAD, more so than, than TRASIT, uh, your organization is really operating on, on the ground level in the fight against illicit trade. Uh, and I wondered if you could kind of give us a few examples or observations, um, uh, specific ones about criminal activity associated with illicit trade. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and I think, you know, just to touch on, on a word you just used, adaptability, I, I think that's something we, need, we all need to be aware of that historically and anyone involved in illicit activity whether that's criminal or terrorist or, or anything organized crime um, they've shown a level of adaptability and flexibility in their modus operandi that that most agencies um, don't have you know agencies historically and governments more broadly tend to be quite slow to adapt to new technology to new methods of doing business but organized crime syndicates illicit trade syndicates terrorist groups uh, they, they don't have the same sort of barriers and, and typically they have a very strong creative mindset and an ability to problem solve because the outcome is so driven by their strong motivation, their strong desire. Um, and so we've certainly seen the adaptability of, of criminal syndicates throughout the pandemic, uh, just like every other major shift that's approached their business model in the past. They've really reflected and acted incredibly quickly, far more quickly than um, than the good guys who are trying to counter that activity. And I think there's some serious lessons in there that we really want to work to promote an increased awareness in how can we start to get ahead of that, to predict the issues, to build capabilities, to really look at adding creative elements of how else could we achieve the outcome and therefore how could we counter that outcome. 
Um, in, in terms of specific connections, I, I think one of the biggest issues we've seen is that members of the public have historically been fairly unaware that there's victims in their consumer choices. Um, and that could be anything from purchasing a illicit tobacco product, purchasing some um, counterfeit alcohol, whatever the case might be, that the driver behind that decision comes from economic choice, wanting to buy something that's more cost effective. Um, and, you know, there's there's no harm. It's a multi-million, multi-billion dollar business that, that loses $20 of revenue by your individual consumer choice. And so one of the things that I'm quite passionate about is making sure that consumers and individual consumers, members of the public, see that there are there are victims in this, that the same groups involved in bringing in illicit tobacco, bringing in alcohol products, bringing in fake handbags, they're the same groups who are in, involved in human trafficking who use uh, modern slavery uh, to drive their manufacture and production chains, who... Um, undertake corruptive activities to try to uh, enable a more effective importing of those goods. This is not something that is victimless. And I think we've made the mistake for too long of, of kind of saying, well, the, the people who are falling victim to this are multinational corporations, they're wealthy, uh, who cares? Who cares if they lose a little bit of money from this? Um, and it's just not the case. And, and as Jeff said, uh, we've seen health complications as a result of pharmaceutical uh, illicit trade. The same has, has certainly been true of the alcohol trade. And if you look at Southeast Asia, um, there's been a range of examples, including around 60 individuals in the last couple of months who have died as a result of, of illicit uh, alcohol. So there's a range of consequences that go beyond just, uh, you know, one company losing a little bit of revenue. If you extrapolate that further, there's obviously that incredibly substantial loss of tax revenue um, and excise revenue to governments that, that creates all sorts of uh, longer term sustainability problems. But in, in terms of specifics, so we we have, uh, and, and you'll, you'll forgive me for not going into details of individual cases here, but we've certainly seen examples of the illicit tobacco trade funding uh, extremist organizations. So that is an activity that puts funds in the hands of terrorists who are using that funding to undertake terrorist attacks. You know, and that's something that we all should take a step back and go, well, that's that's pretty concerning for all of us. What do we do to stop that activity? We've also seen supply chain networks of illicit trade syndicates that have been involved in human trafficking and a, and a huge amount of, of overlap between wildlife trafficking trade and those other consumer products like handbags, tobacco, alcohol. Um, and again, that comes back to the point I was making, that it's a supply chain, that it's a distribution network, and that the item is a profit, um, is, is a direct link to profit and risk. So where there's a chance to make more profit than the risk profile represents, then that's the product that comes to choice. And that's a substantial concern to us. So th thanks for those uh, observations, uh, Shane. I, th I think it's a very important point you make that you know, we can work with governments, we can work with business on illicit trade, but ultimately uh, it's the consumer which is affected uh, by these activities. And it's, I think it's really important to uh, show that there is that kind of direct link and that consumers don't believe it somehow doesn't affect them or is somehow indirect. Um, so thank you very much for um, outlining the work of Crime, Crime Stoppers International and uh, giving us those observations. Um, so last, but certainly not least, I turn to Filippo Musca. Um, so, Filippo, the Syracuse Institute has a number of very, uh, very, very nice, let's say, or very uh, substantial, substantial products, projects on illicit trade, uh, including what I mentioned in your introduction um, on the mechanisms. Um, and I wonder if you could specify um, or kind of outline this project and also specify on um, some of the project, some of the policy recommendations that are arising from this project uh, and that can be used to address criminal activity behind illicit trade. With great pleasure, Graham. Thank you very much. Uh, may I ask the, the staff to um, put the presentation on, the PowerPoint presentation, so to give some visuals of, of what I'm saying. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So, um, first of all, I would like to briefly introduce uh, the Institute I work for and the work, of course, of the Institute. 
We were established in 1972 and, and located in historical Syracuse, uh, once among the most important city-states of Magna Grecia. And you may see in, in, the, in the PowerPoint an aerial photo of the island of Ortigia, where our headquarters are seated. For many years, we have served the Mediterranean region, and you'll see several partner countries highlighted. But the Institute and the Syracuse, could you please go ahead with the, with the slide? Another one, please. Fantastic. So, um, the Institute and the Syracuse network um, of experts have a global reach. Uh, we have served uh, several partner countries, as you see in, in the slide, but we are a global institute. We have consultative status with the UN and we contribute to important and international forums on crime and security matters, including the UN Crime Prevention, um, the UN Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice Network and the OECD Task Force on Countering Illicit Trade. Slide, please. So, the work of the Institute. We work in three mutual reinforcing pillars, technical assistance, training and research. And we have trained more than 60,000 criminal justice officials from more than 170 countries. Since 2016, we have focused on organized crime and illicit trade, specifically across Southeastern Europe, but our program has now become more global and ambitious in recent years building on years of research and consultation. So the project you were mentioning, Hannah, the mechanism for combating illicit trade. This project was launched in November 2018 to a need and an opportunity in the current policy debate. Countries and businesses are crying out for clear, sufficiently specific and well-defined guidelines on how they should tackle illicit trade holistically. In other words, defining the essential legal, regulatory, policy and enforcement measures that work and that should be at, in place at minimum. Indeed, no internationally endorsed guidelines on illicit trades exist today. That's, of course, not to say that there aren't already good ideas out there for tackling illicit trade, for fixing what's broken in the international financial system or in international trade there are certainly our sources of inspiration and guidance. However, existing guidance is a maze for countries and the private sector to navigate. Much of it, it's duplicative or it's too vague to be implemented. And perhaps most crucially, most guidance comes from a particular perspective. For example, it concerns custom officers or it's way too specific to one sector of illicit trade. For example, wildlife trafficking. Slide, please. Many countries and of course also businesses are already overwhelmed in navigating legal and regulatory frameworks and other sometimes helpful but not binding policy guidance at the national, regional and international level. After years of talking about illicit trade and its harmful effects, there are a lot of good ideas out there for addressing the problem. What we believe is needed right now is a coherent, consolidated framework for action, such as framework has the potential to move us, countries and businesses working together from a reactive to a proactive posture that has crime prevention as a key focus. To this end, and through the mechanism for combating illicit trade projects, we see our job connecting the dots and identifying gaps, not reinventing the wheel. Let's try to take a closer look of what we mean by this slide. Actors. There's a wide range of national institutions involved in combating illicit trade. And of course, we would instinctively think of policy makers, criminal justice officials, as well as customs and other border agencies. But there are several other important ones. There's the private sector, producers, manufacturers, traders in the import export businesses, transport and logistics operators, and of course, banks. And all of these actors are those subject to national and legal regulations. In turn, these legal frameworks generally implement a wide range of international treaties containing national legal obligations adopted in an ad hoc piecemeal fashion, fashion over many years. In addition, UN Security Council resolution imposed further obligation on all countries, particularly relevant to the links between terrorism, organized crime and illicit trade, which fall within the Council's international peace and security mandate. 
Of course, these aren't the only source of standards or guidance for counters and businesses. Customs and other enforcement agencies, trade authorities, financial intelligence units are represented by international bodies that address illicit trade related matters. In some cases, these international bodies set further more detailed and more tailored standards than exist in national and international law. And they also have a practical focus. This is true to, for the private sector too. Through industry association and business-led initiatives, they have considerable potential to contribute to harmonization and standardization. The FATF obviously also play an important role when it comes to defining banks' responsibility vis-a-vis -vis customer due diligence and anti-money laundering, elaborating standards to be affected through national regulation. And unfortunately, that's not all. At the national level, actors are bound by national strategy action plans that should identify the country objective and practical approach to combat forms of illicit trade. And there may also be regional agreements in play that seek to coordinate the response to illicit trade among neighbor, neighboring countries. Several intergovernmental forums uh, have tried to grapple with the illicit trade from a broader cross-sectoral perspective. And for each form of illicit trade that captures the attention of the international community, more sector-specific rules, codes of conduct, and policy guidance. This is, and this goes without saying, not an easy environment for, to navigate. And while we know that illicit trade is a problem that requires coordinated action across the all government and across the public and private sector, what does a all government systematic approach to illicit trade actually look like? What are the basic ingredients? What are the progressive steps involved in implementation? Slide please. As I mentioned right now, another, another clip please. Slide. Thank you. So right now, no mechanism exists for advising countries, businesses, where they stand in the fight against illicit trade. A number of institutional mechanisms already exist that monitor countries' compliance with some standards that are commonly associated with efforts to counter illicit trade, especially in anti-corruption, anti-money laundering and governance, uh, governance areas. However, no mechanism is devoted to the elaboration of benchmarks to tackle illicit trade as a phenomenon in on itself. At the same time, the existence of institutional review mechanism in contiguous areas suggests that any new initiative should as much as possible avoid duplicative outcomes and seek to create synergies with those existing mechanisms. Addressing illicit trade across sectors and breaking down the silos. This is the point. The commonalities observed across illicit trade sectors in terms of dynamics, routes followed by traffickers, types of economic and trade incentives, concealment techniques, and criminal enablers, enablers suggest that usefulness of taking a cross-sectoral approach as an indispensable complement to a sector-specific one. <coughs> I'm sorry. Also, while each illicit trade sector adds its own peculiarities and diverse calling for tailor-made responses, they often involve the same or closely connected criminal organization. By engaging in different forms of illicit trade simultaneously, criminal groups use the same routes and distribution channels, and in so doing, they reduce transportation and related costs. Symmetrically, there are tools and approaches that governments, and in particular law enforcement authorities, need to use in relation to illicit trade manifestation. Illicit trade is hard to tackle. The reason it's so, it is so cross-cutting and it touches on the mandates and powers of a really wide range of institutions, and it forces us to cooperate across sectors and more challenging across borders. The major obstacle that prevents us from doing our jobs is the siloed way in which we operate. Silos of information, silos defined by legislation and institutional prerogatives. Too often, especially at the national level, illicit trade is handled in silence by several institutional actors that do not coordinate their actions and even sometimes implement conflicting agendas. And this leads not only to an inefficient or scarce resources, but also to a situation where critical information does not flow among concerned agencies. We need to promote a change in the paradigm. 
in the longer term, we need a paradigm shift. We need that what we call a wall of government approach, which the mechanism that we are presenting here is promoting as the only possible way to tackle illicit trade in an effective manner. Slide deep. So what does a wall of government approach uh, look like? To answer this question, we conducted over 14 months of research and preliminary consultation. The results are a consolidated framework for action that comprises more than 60 recommendations and nearly 200 pages of supporting analysis and exploratory notes. Specific actionable guidance to governments and businesses across six tracks, our six building blocks for a whole government approach. Importantly, implementation is measurable according to a set of quantitative and qualitative indicators. Let's try to take a slightly closer look. Slide, please. So, the guidelines are currently arranged in six tracks, from national leadership and strategies to addressing the root causes and drivers of illicit trade to detection, including the cyber realm to disabling perpetrators. We don't have time this afternoon or this morning or this evening to go through each track in detail, but there are a couple of guidelines in particular that are key to mitigating the harmful effects of illicit trade, which threatens already slow progress towards the SDGs. One track of the guidelines aims to reinforce leadership, strategies and coordination in the fight against illicit trade. These guidelines, these guidelines consider the underlying institutional and strategic framework that should be in place at the backbone for countries' efforts to address illicit trade in a cohesive and coordinated manner through a wall of government approach. It, is also, it also identifies the important role that the private sector and civil society groups are called upon to play as part of this broader institutional design. For example, we advise countries that countries should as a preliminary step, undertake a world government review of already existing national strategies, action plan, and policies related to illicit trade, including specific forms of illicit trade, organized crime, corruption, illicit, illicit financial flows, including money laundering and terrorism financing, anti and anti-terrorism, of course. This review should map all relevant actors at the national level and their respective responsibilities, identifying gaps in strategic, legal and regulatory framework and assess the extent to which existing strategies can be streamlined and better connected to each other in order to unify the country's overall response to illicit trade. A different guideline points to the need for governments to identify a strategic lead, an authority with primary strategic responsibility for the national response to illicit trade. The core responsibility of the authority, which would always be delegated, could be to devise and oversee implementation of a dedicated national illicit trade strategy, address the nature, scope and scale of illicit trade at the national level, propose legislative or policy changes to strengthen the national response to illicit trade or otherwise improve its effectiveness, including measure to ensure full compliance with international conventions and related legal instruments. Promote cooperation and information sharing, including between governmental and private sector entities. And in, an, in a complementary track of guidelines, the Institute calls on countries to better understand and address the root causes and drivers of illicit trade. This calls on governmental and non-governmental actors to take account of the broad social, economic and environment causes and impacts of illicit trade, especially in the process of assessing current and future policy responses. In this context, the guidelines point to the need for an extensive awareness raising campaign among diverse communities of stakeholders about the causes and consequences of illicit trade. Here, Countries need to improve the evidence base for national policy making by conducting cross sectoral and multidisciplinary analysis of the political economy of illicit trade in the specific country, drawing on data, analysis, and insights of the key national institutions, their institutional counterparts at the regional or sub regional level, and from other countries that pose particular illicit trade risk, uh, international agencies and relevant private sector and civil society actors. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Filippo. Um, I think I must say, I've, I've read some of the output of the uh, mechanisms project. I think it's an extremely valuable uh, endeavor and it makes a lot of very good points. Um, a couple I'd like to kind of pick up on there. Um, the frag really the fragmented uh, nature of the international response to kind of illicit trade. Uh, I'm aware that in our, in our own kind of house in the UN system, there are around 20 different UN organizations which deal with illicit trade in various ways, but these tend to, tend to be um, dealt with on a sector by sector basis. Um, and as you say, there's, there's kind of a, a framework which is more akin to some kind of silos. Um, at UNCTAD, as we've developed our, our work on illicit trade, we've tried to bring other organizations in under, in, under the same umbrella to get them to talk and to realize about the commonalities of, uh, the, of those sectors and of illicit trade across those sectors. Um, another point which I found really interesting is, is your work in the mechanism of a, of a whole government approach to uh, illicit trade and talking about national reviews. Now, um, if I may put you on the spot, Filippo, um, so taking those two things together um, and you know, applying the whole government approach to the international level, what would you like to see um, international organisations I mean, for instance, UN organizations like UNTAD and UNODC um, do more of to combat illicit trade? Well, that's, that's a very easy question to, to respond. Thank you very much, Graham. Well, uh, uh, that's exactly the point, though. The, we have on, uh, on one side, we have all the different forms of illicit trade that are most of the times addressed in a very sectorial way. And on the other side, what we need is a higher degree uh, of communication and coordination at the international level, as you correctly mentioned, uh, for example, UNODC, UN agencies like UNODC, but especially uh, at the regional and national level. Um, just, and just to pick, quickly pick up on what you mentioned, UNODC, I mean, uh, almost, um, almost, uh, all the departments of, of UNODC uh, deals well deal with with illicit trade. Uh, is there an a, a, an efficient coordinated approach that encompass, encompasses them all? Probably yes. Could it be improved? Probably yes. And and, and this is essential. And and we see the same problem also uh, at the national level, obviously. But. So the, the main difference is, is that UNODC and, okay, and UN in general is essential for building the national official capacities in many areas of, 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 that are related to criminal justice and, and law enforcement. So in, in a nutshell, a higher degree of, of coordination and, and cooperation at the interagency level as well as the, the national and international. I mean, we, we could speak about this for probably the next three or four days. <laughs> well, we've only got half an hour, unfortunately. Um, so th thank you for the response, uh, Filippo. Uh, I'd just like to bring Jeff and Shane on, on the same question. I, I know Jeff, the Ungtad and Trasset have worked together on a number of uh, events. Uh, and I wonder if you um, had some comments on that. And likewise, likewise, Shane. Yeah, Graham, I mean, one of the, you know, one of the, we had that event that I mentioned in my remarks at UNCTAD. One of the objectives there was to bring in other agencies. I think we succeeded there. Not only not only did we you have, I think, 55 member states, but I think there were nine uh, different intergovernmental organizations, some within the UN family, others more re regional, uh, like the OECD. So I think part of it is raising the awareness like you mentioned there's i think it's no fewer than 20 organizations and conventions they all address illicit trade in one way or another but they all contain enormous amount of resources uh, they contain the ability to do uh, capacity building in countries they contain the ability to collect and share data and information uh, they contain the ability to provide member states with guidance um, and policy recommendations and standards to implement. And I think for us, when we look at that, uh, 
uh, I don't look at this as a, a problem as much as a potential solution. I think somewhere down the track is the ability to perhaps either modify some conventions or create a convention with an umbrella uh, effect that would a be better able the UN family to channel all of its resources towards stopping illicit trade. Hi, Shane, I wonder if you had any uh, comment on that. Yeah, so I, I, I'd like to look at it from the other angle. I, I think there's such a such a large amount of government agencies, of multinational NGOs, of, of all of these other groups that are focusing on it um, from a, a government perspective. I think we need to get the people involved. Um, you know, I mentioned it in my comments. I think we need to raise awareness amongst our communities and amongst our societies that there's a range of impacts from this activity because I, I'm not sure that's very widely known, certainly within consumer mm -hmm. markets. And there's a, there's a limit to obviously how well that information can penetrate, but I mean, we, we shouldn't let the difficulty of, of a problem uh, stop us from pursuing it. And, and really that's what we want to focus on, educating members of the public that their consumer choices drive a range of other um, negative impacts on society, on their communities, on them as individuals. Um, and, and I think it's inherent in us to, obviously we need to work with government bodies. We need to come up with an effective um, legislative regulatory framework to address some of these problems. Law enforcement need to continue their fight against illicit trade, customs and excise and everything else. But, but let's mobilize the people. And that's that's yeah. really what Crime Stoppers International is about, using people power to try to drive some change. Thanks, Shane. Um, again, I guess you kind of touched on it there about, about what is most effective in, in combating illicit trade. But I wonder if you could, um, all three of you could kind of map out yeah. kind of ideally your next steps of the organization to really support member states in, in combating illicit trade. Um, and ideally what you'd like to do next is organizations and, um, you know, and, and kind of what, from your perspectives, I think you each come, you each come from, there's a very nice panel in that you each come from very, three different, very approaches. I mean, as Shane uh, outlined there, um, what you'd like to see done um, more in, the, in those, from those spheres to combat. I'm happy to start with Shane, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I mean, it, it certainly struck me in, in listening to both Jeff and, and Filippo that, that even our three organizations need to be doing a lot more, let alone when we bring in the enormous UN umbrella. Cooperation and collaboration really needs to be the key here, that we all have um, a goal of ending illicit trade, but with slightly different focuses on the method and, and the, the drive to do that. So I think there's a lot more that we could all be doing um, in cooperation uh, in, in that space. In terms of our next steps, we we would encourage any member state, um, as, as well as any corporation or private entity, to really um, focus on on how places like Trasset, uh, Syracuse, uh, and and Crime Stoppers can really help them to develop that messaging and build that awareness. We'd we'd love to work with governments around the world to build that capacity to actually mobilise the enormous amount of people to provide information that might directly link to investigating and stopping illicit trade. You know, there's that's everything from a consumer buying a product and then going, oh, this is actually illicit. I need to provide that information to someone. To even just seeing advertisements and marketplaces available online and flagging that for the attention of government. You know, that's that's an yeah. enormously powerful thing. Thanks, Shane. Uh, does anyone, Jeff or uh, yeah. anybody, want to jump in here? Yeah, sure. I'll um, let's take a let's take the example of counterfeiting as a form of illicit trade and communicating to governments. So that's I think that's your question is mobilizing government um, at the national level. So when speaking to governments, if I'm just talking to them about counterfeiting or protecting intellectual property rights, I'm not really speaking their language. The language of governments is about prosperity. You know, it's about security. It's about development. It's about sustainable development. It's about human rights. It's not necessarily about IP right. And I think, you know, what we were trying to achieve with the, the report that I presented earlier, 
on um, illicit mapping illicit trade against the sustainable development goals. The, the goals are the language of government these days. And I think if we put the, what we want to do is we want to put the issue of illicit trade into the language of governments and help them understand how they can achieve these holistic goals that they have. Not that they pick off one form of illicit trade and say, how do I, how do I solve that problem? But solving that problem within the con this broader context. I have another example of what we do is we, in addition to the report, okay, so the message of that report is you government, if you do a better job fighting illicit trade, you can do a better job achieving your sustainable development goals, the bigger picture. Uh, we published a report earlier this year, just in January, where we also did a correlation against a country's uh, ability capacity to fight illicit trade and their sovereign credit ratings. And we found a direct correlation there. And the message to governments and to finance ministers was, if you can prioritize and do a better job fighting illicit trade, you can do a better job, you can achieve better credit ratings and perhaps do a better job attracting investment. So in other words, what we're trying to say to governments is communicate how illicit trade falls into what they need to be doing and what they're hoping to accomplish. Uh, beyond that, I think that's a nice segue to what I anticipate Filippo is going to say, is that we need to put in place a set of, of standards. You know, how can governments tackle this? What do we already know? What have we learned from other governments? What have we what have we learned in one type of illicit trade sector that could be shared in other types? You know, how can the 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 progress we've made in fighting wildlife trafficking, how can that be deployed in fighting smuggling or human trafficking? So I think you know, one of the things that we want to do through forums like this, working with UNODC, working with UNCTAD, working with WTO, is to try to help build some standards that help governments move along this path. So that's a segue for you, Filippo. Yeah, okay, fantastic. So I will just build a couple of, of, of ideas on what Jeff just mentioned. Well, illicit trade refers to a variety of existing crimes and, and crimes and related illicit practices. And what we see that countries uh, will already have in place strategies and plans to address some of these uh, crimes. Uh, human trafficking or organized crime or money laundering purposes. What it's needed, uh, it's an holistic national strategy on illicit trade. And this strategy shouldn't need to replace the existing effort, but developing, as I mentioned already, a wall of a government response, uh, joining up the existing response in that, uh, and then trying to address the gaps that, that remain. Of course, to address those gaps, it requires, it's requested to uh, understand the very nature and dynamics of, of illicit trade in a specific country, which also depend on the broader regional context. Uh, therefore, while estimating the scale, prevalence and seriousness of illicit trade is difficult, a national strategy is unlikely to be effective unless it targets its intervention towards the particular threat impacting the country. And in assessing those threats, countries should consider both the transnational dimension as well as forms of illicit trade that take place predominantly or exclusively within their own borders. Responding, Graham, on what we would like to do. As mentioned, we are about to complete the first version of, of the guidelines. The next step will be to refine them through an inclusive and broad uh, consultation process. And this is also why we are here and we were happy to present this um, today. Um, in the coming months, uh, we will also try, we'll also pursue discussions to identify the most um, effective and feasible way to review the compliance uh, on the ground. 
uh, which would lead me to the very last point. And there is no way to understand if a concept is a really solid one unless it is tested uh, on, on the ground. And this is why we are envisaging the next phase of our project to engage a few countries or maybe even sub-regions that are willing to help us uh, understanding if the mechanism that we are creating on paper works in practice. Thank you, Filippo. Sorry, I think you lost me there a minute. People in Geneva are waking up and beginning to use uh, the internet here. Um, I think it's a really nice point you make, uh, Filippo, about uh, you know, the need to see the work on the ground and fits in very well with uh, Shane's uh, observations about the needing to kind of engage consumers and engage uh, you know, the end users in, uh, in these kind of mechanisms and products. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. I just wondered if any of the panelists had any more comments. Uh, on, on the other's interventions or had any more points they'd like to make? In that case, oh, sorry, is there anyone? No. Okay, in that case, I, I'd just like to um, thank the, the three panelists for today's session. Um, I think we've made a really nice job of showing that, you know, from Jeff's point of, point of view that uh, the SDGs are all affected by, by illicit trade, but essentially all, all illicit trade affects you know, two SDGs, one of those being SDG uh, 16. Uh, and uh, Filippo pointing out that really what is needed are, are kind of national, but also international kind of frameworks that deal with illicit trade uh, in a kind of a holistic manner. And then Shane's, I think, comes from a very nice point of view of the kind of enforcement the kind of on the ground, the need to engage, uh, not just at an international level, not just a kind of a, a kind of global level, with kind of broad um, and goals and mechanisms, but actually kind of engage and uh, engage consumers and make kind of everyone know that illicit trade affects them directly. Um, so I thank you, panelists, for your uh, participation, both very early and very late at night, or sometimes in the middle of the day. Um, so thank, thank you very much for your uh, very informative um, contributions. I think they've kind of married up nicely. We have a nice, uh, nice uh, kind of overlap between what you've been saying and really some good points for the, the way forward and uh, some policy recommendations that can be uh, taken on board. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you those in the audience who have been watching and I hope they've uh, received some, um, some good wisdom from our, our August panel here. So thank you very much. I wish you all a good day, evening, night, morning. Thank you very much.